Locks. Psst, it's locks. All along. Locks. What are you talking about? Lots of copies keep stuff safe. Locks. It's an old phrase. It comes from the archivists of the film world, but it's very much relevant in today's digital world with our mixed bag of digital assets and media stored on all sorts of weird and wonderful devices. Let's look at how and why we should be backing up our projects in this digital age right now. If you're new here and you're thinking, who is this dude and why does he like locks? Well, I'm Andy Edmondson and this is DigiPro Tips. We work smarter, not harder here. Why? Because it gives you the time to be more creative. And hey, welcome. When you finish a project, it's often unclear what it is that you're supposed to do with all of the assets that you've collected in the process. And if we're being honest, come on, level with me here, we're probably all guilty of doing absolutely nothing with them whatsoever. It is the easy way out, and we just hope that that project never has to see the light of day again. In the drawer it goes. Well, yes, that is what a lot of us do, but it's not what we should be doing, is it? We are professionals after all. Having a solid archival strategy is crucial, and it doesn't matter if you're an indie filmmaker or a Hollywood studio. Even large motion picture studios can lose assets, sometimes catastrophically. So it's vital you have a plan for archiving your projects so that you can access them in the future. Access isn't the only reason to have a good archival workflow either. It can actually save you and your business money. There will be a vast majority of you out there that use external hard drives or tiered cloud storage plans that all cost money. By keeping only the media that we need to be able to bring a project back to life and ditching everything else that didn't make the cut, well then that saves you storage space which ultimately saves you money down the line. Oh, and by the way, if you're interested in ditching that external hard drive life, I know it's hard to, but it is worth it, then you can check out my videos on Synology up there on how to do that and also another one on QNAP up there and they'll get you started and you can hop right back over here. You can thank me later. Properly archiving and backing up projects might also be part of your contract obligations with a particular project. Project contracts, why am I clapping? Project contracts regularly stipulate that you will need to have access, easy access to the media after delivery for up to 30 to 60 days. That's kind of standard in a lot of contracts these days. But also that you need to be able to have it stored on a medium for up to two years even. Failure to do that could result in consequences for you or the company when a client comes back asking for changes and you can't fulfill it. This is also a good point to mention. If you're not involved in those conversations, get involved because that protects you protects the client. It also puts you at the negotiating table to determine how long you're going to store something on what medium. And also, if the client comes back after that, you have it in writing. All right, so the initial step in the archival process is to determine the delivery date. This is when your project is transferred to the network, the distributor, the streamer, the client, whoever it might be that is the end user of that file or folder of files and it's not your responsibility anymore. Now just because you've handed it over it is not advisable to archive a project immediately after this delivery date. Why? Because clients tend to have a habit of coming back and asking for changes in that preceding period afterwards. That's why in the contract you usually have 30 to 60 days of hot storage, i.e. a medium that you can easily boot up that project from and be able to make changes without having to get things transferred from other places, you know, download it from cloud storage, whatever it might be, it's easily accessible. That is hot storage. And cold storage, where you might store it up to two years, is that other type of storage. It's somewhere that it can be stored long-term, that costs you less money, but if a client comes back, it might take a day or two to be able to boot it back up and make those changes. The other major question here, and it gets us all, is how many copies you feel you need of the project and the media to be confident 
that you can bring it back to life, to boot it back up when you need to. Bringing it back to that acronym at the start that I love so much, LOCKS. Lots of copies keep stuff safe. The more copies you can reasonably afford, the better. That last part is key here too, reasonably afford. We know that storage space comes at a premium and I mentioned at the beginning that by archiving, you can save money. Well, if we're keeping lots of copies, that's gonna increase the amount of storage space that we need, so it would cost me more money, no? Well, bear with me because I have a solution that works for this use case without costing the world and ensures that your projects are stored in multiple locations. But to unpick the money question here, as part of your obligations under a contract, you should be storing lots of copies anyway. So therefore the costs are the costs that you have for that project. How you archive them is the way that you are gonna be able to save money here. When archiving, carefully think about what you need to store from a project because obviously everything that we do store has a cost when it comes to storage. At a bare minimum, you're definitely going to want to store the final master export file. Additionally, you need to discuss with your director, your client, your team, whoever is responsible or briefed in the project, how many of the rushes or dailies that they want to be able to keep. Because obviously the more data you keep, the higher the cost. And although clients like it, not every single thing needs to be stored. Typically a 4K video master and a DCP will take up around about a terabyte of space. It's also a very, very good idea to store the stems in the music mix. That's usually a dialogue stem and an M&E stem, which is music and effects. Now I personally would consider storing an EDL or an XML of your timeline as well, because these are file formats that are accepted by basically every single NLE out there. Now the edit that you completed on a specific platform might not be the platform that you use five years down the line, but also if it is the same platform, it might not accept projects from five years ago either. So an EDL where you can build the timeline back up from your edit decision list, that's always going to be able to be opened. And so that's just a safe way of storing your project without having to try and unpick a video master file and make it work for you. But that is not to say that we shouldn't store the project file. We absolutely should because you know the client's gonna come back in six months and ask for changes and it's highly likely that the platform that you used will accept a project file from six months ago. So definitely store the project file. All right, pro tippers, now we're getting to the nitty gritty. There are many, many, many ways to do this and you may find your own method or process that works well for you. And it can be completely dependent on the NLE or the software, softwares that you are using, but I'm gonna base this on Premiere Pro. Premiere has a built-in project management tool, as do most NLEs to be fair, which allows you to take or copy the original media in your timeline um, and transcode it or copy it to another place and has many, many other options for you to be able to consolidate your project and transfer it somewhere else. There are many options to choose here. You can copy the whole project, including all of the original media. You can transcode the original media to a better codec that is, you know, compressed or even, you know, a better intermediate codec, you can transcode only the clips in the timeline so that the rest of the handles the rush in the rushes are not copied or transcoded. So that slims down your project even further. You can choose for it to ignore any assets, files, rushes, dailies, effects that it wasn't included in the final edit. You can include handles on your clips. So 12, 24 is the standard with this so that you do have some flexibility if you do need to open it up and make a change to a shot. If you need to swap something out and it needs to move around a little bit, having handles is a very good thing to do here. There are a lot of options for how you want to consolidate and move this project. What you do and what you choose will depend on the project at hand but you do have options here and by transcoding to an intermediate codec, only the bits in the timeline of the clip that you need with some handles will significantly cut down your project because those long takes, those rushes that you only use a tiny sliver of, you don't need those anymore. Those gigabytes are gone. Now, if you used effects or audio designs, 
in your timeline that were outside of Premiere or your NLE, then you're gonna to want to try and do the same with those too. For example, After Effects has a collect files feature which allows you to bundle all of the, you know, your, your comps and your solids and your assets into one project file that it then copies somewhere else. So you in, can include that in your archive folder to go with your Premiere project management file as well. Make sure that if you're using licensed music or sound effects, that you include those in your folder as well, because you don't want to come, you know, a few years down the line and open up the project and find that you use a track way back when you're editing it and now you cannot find it anywhere and you certainly cannot find the licenses for those. Having to re-edit an old project with a new music or sound effects is just a headache you don't want to get into. The crucial question is now upon us. This will differ for everyone and their preferences, but I have a solution that I'm gonna to propose to you. Before I share that with you, my recommendation for anybody, whether you go with my solution or not, is to have at least two copies, just, just two at the bare minimum. And that can be one stored locally on your computer, one on a hard drive, one in the cloud, one on your NAS, wherever it might be, just make sure that they're separate. If you can put them in separate physical locations, so an office or an, and at home, even better. Just two ways of minimizing the loss that might occur. Okay, Andy, what is this grand solution you've been harping on about? Well, let me tell you, it's to leverage the power of NAS storage and cloud storage together. That was probably not as dramatic as it seemed in my head, but the power of those two together is a very, very good combination. You see, if you have a Synology or a QNAP, for example, these are two brands of user-friendly NAS systems that I recommend to people, they both have the functionality of cloud sync storage, which means they can connect to your personal cloud storage and act as a local sync for it. Or in contractual terms, your NAS can act as the hot storage and the cloud storage can act as the cold storage. But even better than all of that is because it saves you money. Having your NAS with projects that you're currently working with and hot projects from 30 to 60 days ago means you have a lot less physical media to have to store right now when everything else is up there and possibly on backup NASes elsewhere, that is a lot less than having to go and buy physical drives time and time and time and time again, losing them, losing the cables, them not booting up, whatever it might be, that unit right there holds what you need right now, that up there, holds what you need potentially in the future. And I hear you, some of you saying, won't this cost quite a lot? Well, yes and no. Initially, yes, there is an investment in your NAS system, but over the duration, because these things are gonna last you, you know, five years plus, think how many hard drives you would buy in five years compared to just one NAS system and your cloud storage. You're gonna save money over time. So the investment is now, but the money saved is down the road. So what about those two copies you were talking about, Andy? If you've only got one in the cloud, where's the other one? Well, that's a very good point. And in this use case, a NAS doesn't need to connect to just one cloud storage. It can connect to however many you like. So AWS cold storage plans, which are very, very cheap, are a very, very good way of adding a second location. Obviously, both of them are in the cloud, but one is more accessible than the other. The AWS is for last resort it takes a while to bring it back down. Whereas, you know, Dropbox, Box, Google Drive, it would take a day. AWS could take a couple of days, but it's safe and it's stored in AWS and it's safe and it's stored in one of those other cloud service providers. It means you don't have to buy any more physical media, which costs more than your cloud storage and you won't lose it either. So you see, by combining local and cloud storage together, you have that security and peace of mind Plus, you get all of the benefits of network attached storage, shared storage, such as creating your own render farm, mm -hmm. 10 gigabit network connectivity for editing 4K in real time amongst many users and storing potentially unlimited projects between the two. What's not to love about this? Wait, what, hang on, 
I can edit 4K footage in real time from an ass. I thought it was just a slow backup thing. Nope, it is certainly not. And it is more than capable of being more than just a storage facility. Check out how right here.